This prism may just fizz. While we've always known that diet soda can't possibly balance out a meal of fried chicken, fries, mac and cheese topped off with a brownie sundae, it turns out that the diet soda may be problematic in and of itself. Recent studies suggest that drinking diet soda may confuse the body's ability to regulate calories. That is, it may confuse the body into thinking it's hungry when it's actually full. To take a look at whether diet drinks are fool's gold, or at least how they impact the body. We're joined by Dominica Rubino. She's the Diabetes and Metabolism Director at the Washington Center for Weight Management and Research. Welcome, Dr. Rubino. Hi, thank you. There seems to be some conflicting evidence in the general media about exactly what diet soda actually does. Does it really confuse the body in this way that some articles are saying? Well, you know, I think the thing is, is there's some increasing evidence now, um, largely because I think we're starting to understand more about the hormonal signals after eating, okay? And I think with the advent of surgery and people are looking at different things, we're, you know, with the gastrointestinal tract, we're starting to understand that all the way through beyond the stomach, all the way through, you know, through the intestine, actually all the way down to the large colon, or, uh, colon and the rectum, there are actually cells that are responding to nutrients being delivered that then stimulate hormones and those hormones actually um, signal back to the brain in terms of satiety, fullness, etc. So I think we as, you know, in the medical community, scientists who are really working at this are starting to actually understand that, thing, that everything is actually much more complicated than we thought. Okay, so first of all, it's based on that. And we now are understanding or starting to, because people are looking at this, what, do, what are these signals? What's going on? And so now we're finding out the suggestion is this particular sweetness or the, the um, signal that comes from the use of artificial sweeteners actually doesn't elicit the same type of signals that sucrose might eat or ingested food. You know, there's been a lot of controversy about liquid calories versus food calories, right? Now we're taking liquid calories and we're looking at differences between sucrose uh, and then artificial sweeteners. So I think it's conceivably a problem in the sense that, yes, we don't really understand. And now there's a suggestion that if we don't get the metabolic signals from this particular, you know, the artificial sweeteners, then that obviously could affect other eating behavior. If we're not feeling full, we might have an increased desire to eat more to go along with that. Or, you know, some people have suggested it's just a behavioral effect that, well, I had my, you know, my diet soda, so now I can have my pie because I saved my calories. <laughs> so, you know, I think we just have to step back and take a look at it. First of all, is there a difference in quote-unquote calories? Yes, there is. There is a difference in calories. And on a practical level, if you're someone with diabetes and you're normally drinking a lot of sugar soda, does substituting diet soda help? Yes, it does. Okay. But then the concern, I think, comes down to a lot of anything. You know, we now, there are some papers that are showing that if you have the, the artificially sweetened beverages, then you don't get the normal hormonal response that you normally get after sugar is ingested. So then the question is, if you're not getting those signals, what's happening? What's happening to our brain? What's happening to our eating behavior, et cetera? So it's actually pretty complicated right now, but it's interesting. I have to admit that I have a little bit of cynicism when we come to stories like this, and it really mm -hmm. comes from two elements. The mm -hmm. first is almost every nutritional study I encounter basically starts with the suggestion that what I'm doing is wrong and I'm going to die from it. <laughs> And that's a little worrisome. That's a tad bit cynical, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> the, the other one is, is a little more practical. I remember a study a few years ago that was looking at an artificial sugar, and they were testing mice in this artificial sugar, and they determined that it was carcinogenic. It was causing cancer. Now, right. when you dig into the study a little bit, you found out that they were giving these mice the equivalent of 20 pounds of this artificial sugar a day. Right. And my brain was saying, well, if you give me 20 pounds of anything, it's going to have a pretty bad effect. And right. so when we look at this study or these series of studies, because now we're seeing some epidemiological studies as well as biological okay. studies, are they good science? Are we seeing things that 
we really should be paying attention to? Actually, I think so. I mean, right now, like this, you know, review article that triggered everything, it it actually, to, to be fair, because I know it's, some people have criticized it, to be fair, they really represented in, in a nice review both, you know, mentioning the papers that support it and the papers that don't support it, right? And first of all, I think human nature, unfortunately, is to like extremes, right? And to, you know, extremes kind of sell, and, you know, we can say, you know, just as the, you know, 20 pounds of sugar substitute causing cancer, you know, no one is actually going to do that. However, I think what's important is mostly the awareness, because even though it hasn't been shown, I think if you just polled a fair number of people, they would believe that the soda or the artificial sweetener would be, quote unquote, healthier for them or potentially result in weight loss, right? Even if it's not labeled as such, even if people have never shown that or proven that, right? People are going to assume because there's not sugar, it's healthier, right? So the problem is you really want to just make sure people understand what they're getting into. I mean, in reality, you know, we don't want people to drink two liters of sugar soda a day. I'm not sure that two liters of diet soda, regardless of whatever the effect is, is necessarily good for you either. I mean, we need to get people to be more moderate in general. I don't think anybody knows. You know, there was some, somewhere in the, one of those papers that said that, you know, people who had one artificially sweetened beverage, you know, might have been an increased risk. I don't know that that's true either. I mean, one, it's hard to know. And in some of the studies, because these are not, you know, randomized, controlled, prospective studies, and the majority of them are not, the difficulty is you really have to sort out the population. You know, what are other people eating? What's their totally calorie intake? You know, what's the look of everything, you know, to be fair? So I think there's animal studies that are suggesting that the regulation is different. And as I said, this is, there's a lot of work going on right now to try to understand what are the gastrointestinal signals. And there are more than we realized. And so part of that quest is just understanding basic physiology. What is a physiology? We took a lot for granted just like 15 years ago when we, you know, discovered that the adipocyte, the fat cell, is actually producing a lot of different hormonal signals that go back to the brain. 20 years ago, we didn't know that. We thought fat cells were just sort of sitting around storing extra energy, and now we know more about it. And because there's so much research in terms of obesity, because it is such a problem, I think we're understanding on a finer level what's going on in the body, what's the feedback. And, you know, we can't assume that any particular thing that we ingest doesn't have some side effect. Is it reasonable to talk about one signal, or should we be looking, or are there studies that are looking at how that signal is transmitted at different stages of life. Is the data that's being generated by this food, by this sucrose, by this artificial sweetener, by fructose, does it come out differently when you're three versus when you're 20 versus when you're 90? Well, yeah, no, that's totally important. And developmentally, there's going to be differences, right? There's gender differences, there's age differences. And there, there is a suggestion of that where, you know, um, in this review article mentioned two different studies where um, they took children who were already drinking sugar soda, right, uh, and who were normal weight, and they split the group and half the group switched to a diet soda. And if those children taking the diet soda, they actually um, had lower glucose levels um, and I believe it was lower waist circumference level. However, when they looked at adults who were overweight and they looked at, I think, believe there's three groups, sugar, soda, artificial sweetened beverages, and those who were, were switched to water, there was no weight difference between the um, artificial and the sugar sweetened. However, there was a metabolic difference in those subjects that were drinking water instead had lower fasting glucose levels. So... You know, it's interesting in that, yes, absolutely, there are going to be differences in terms of the person's genetics, let's say. There's going to be differences in terms of their age or their stage in development. There probably is a difference whether they're overweight or not overweight to begin with, because that is a different situation, too. And, of course, then you have to control for all other factors. What are their coping mechanisms? Do they sleep? What are they eating? Et cetera. So, 
when they do studies, they just look at an average and a mean, but it is really important to look very carefully at the group that's being studied and how is that really being applied to that particular person. You know, there are some people who have a soda once in a while, and there are other people, you know, I have patients who drink probably two liters of diet soda a day. Now, in context, that could be hurting them. It could also be helping their diabetes because they happen to be a volume drinker, and if they drink two liters of sugar soda, their sugars are going to be way off the charts, and there is an appreciable difference when they're drinking diet soda, and they will have to work with their volume situation. I think a lot of things have to be put into context, and I would agree with you that there, there are different effects um, that really do need to be taken into consideration in terms of what is the actual real effect in a given population. And with that in mind, given the fact that we can't give a prescription to every single person who might be listening, what mm -hmm. is the takeaway message? Is it moderation? Is it to talk to doctors? I would say so. I think moderation is so not sexy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the reality, right? Most of us know that we probably should eat more fruits and vegetables, right? And I think most people know at the core that, you know, perhaps homemade stuff is better than stuff that we just buy out because there's a lot more salt and a lot more sugar and a lot more fat. And, you know, I think moderation is probably better in almost everything. You know, getting some regular exercise, trying to get enough sleep. I mean, it's super boring. I mean, you know, if you can sort of really advertise the miracle cure and say, hey, this is the key thing. The reason all of this is really hard and taking care of ourselves is the truth is we got to look at all different things that we do, and we probably need to moderate a fair number of them. So, I mean, on a practical level, yes, it's just not very exciting. Looking through the prism to discover that maybe my mother was right all these years. I'm Andrew Hiller for The Voice of Russia, and I've been speaking with Domenica Robino. She's the Diabetes and Metabolism Director at the Washington Center for Weight Management and Research. Thank you so much.